Okay, we're going to be looking at problem 23 and 24 on page 466 from chapter 8. And hopefully this will be a good introduction to what it means to have a sample proportion and the sampling distribution of a sample proportion. Uh, the first thing I want to point your attention to is the graph I have in, here in green. This is what the population proportion uh, would look like. Uh, please notice that uh, population proportions are the original population distribution is never normally distributed. What you're always going to have is a bar graph. In this case, on the right-hand side, I have the 65% of the time that's a success based on what was given in the problem. And on the left-hand side, I have the 35% of the time that's a failure. Now, what's going to happen is, as I get a sample proportion, uh, just to get the concept built here in our minds, uh, let's first consider a sample of size 2. If you have a sample of size 2, it is possible that for this sample of size 2, you have uh, both would be um, a, one of my larger values. So it's possible that you have two larger values, which would be about like that. It's also possible, and actually pretty likely, that you would have one large value and one small value. And that means your proportion, instead of being 100%, uh, would be 50%, because one would be a success and one would be a failure. And it's also possible that you randomly select two items that are both uh, non-successes or failures, and that would be over on this side of the distribution. So what we can see is for a sample proportion, um, we can always ready see, even with a relatively small, very small sample size of two, we're beginning to get closer to the true value. Because in the long run, what should happen is we should get closer to this true value of 0.65. Because uh, with a sample of size two, of course, it's impossible to ever have 65%, but it would look like that. I'm going to just show you one more step in this process. We're going to look at a sample of size three. So if I have a sample proportion of p hat with um, size 3, um, that is going to look something like this. It is possible that you randomly pick all three um, that are non-successes, so that's still a possibility. It's more likely, though, that you pick um, at least one that's a that would be a success. So that would be the chances of getting one success and two failures. It's also possible to pick two successes and three failures. That one would look something more like this. And then it's also possible to pick all three successes. This looks something more like that. Now what you can see all the ready by the time I have a sample of size three, I'm getting a significant amount of my distribution. This entire bar here is getting, um, while technically it's at, you know, two-thirds, two out of three successes, it's getting very close to the true value of 0.65. And I'm beginning to see that my data is be beginning to uh, cluster evenly around that sample proportion. So what's going to happen is as I continue to increase my sample size, I'm going to get more and more um, data distributed around the true population proportion of 0.65, and that's what you can expect. Now, one word on notation before we go on and uh, start looking at the actual problem here. Uh, the population proportion can be denoted in two different ways. It can be denoted with a pi, which is what your book uses, or a p. Um, some, uh, your book um, likes to be consistent with Greek letters standing for parameters, so pi is the Greek letter P, so that's why they choose to use pi for probability and proportion. Uh, the other one, uh, though some other books, instead of using uh, pi for population and uh, P for uh, sample, as uh, your book does, they use a P for population and a p hat for sample. And I'm going to usually use this second notation um, where p is my population proportion and p hat is a sample proportion. But anytime on a test or on an AP or even on the AP exam, they're going to have to denote, um, cannot just use the symbol, but they will have to denote whether they're using p to stand for a population proportion or a sample proportion. So they will always have to not just use the symbol, but also describe whether they're talking about a population or a sample. Okay, I have uh, just taken a quick sketch of what the graph would look like with a sample of size 10.
once you get a sample of size 10, you'll notice in the blue here that there is virtually no chance of getting all failures. Um, it's a negligible probability out there of getting all failures or even getting one failure. Not much chance of two failures. Uh, not much of three. Mostly, you notice that you're getting concentrated around that the 60 and 70 percent, these bars here, are the highest ones, which shows that it's clustering nicely around the population proportion of 0.65. And uh, you can see that it's beginning to um, cluster around that thing and becoming a little bit more normally distributed. It still looks a little skewed to the left end, which is uh, to be expected. Uh, it's going to tend to be skewed in the direction where there's less data initially, but um, it's getting better than it was. Now, um, you do not have to be able to sketch these distributions uh, to do these uh, problems, but it's good to understand what's going on so you can see conceptually uh, why the answer is what it is. Now, for number 23, it's wanting to know the mean and standard deviation. Well, as we have already pointed out, the mean value of your um, sample proportion is always going to be the true population proportion, which in this case is 0 0.65. And we can see as our sample size increases, I'm definitely beginning to cluster to that 0 0.65 value. Um, then the standard deviation of the sample proportion, we can see as the sample size increases, my estimate for sample proportion becomes more accurate. And the formula I'm going to use to figure out exactly what it is, is it's going to be the population proportion times 1 minus the population proportion divided by n, all of that under a square root. So in this particular case, it's your probability of success, 0.65 times your probability of failure, 0 0.35, divided by your sample size, and in this case, a sample of size 10. Now what you will notice is that um, just like for sample means, increasing sample size will decrease variability. In this case, though, uh, we don't have a standard deviation when we're talking about proportions anyway. Uh, but what we do have that will affect our variability is how far apart those are. So if the probability is um, close to 50-50, it's going to maximize your amount of variability of your sampling proportion because it'll be longer before you focus in on a value. The more lopsided your initial probability is, the more quickly your estimates become accurate with even a smaller sample size. Once I type that formula in the calculator, it gives me a value of 0 0.1508. And what that tells us is that um, our, our expected value, our long-term, our average value for a sample pr proportion uh, would be about 0.65, so it's clustering around the 0.65, but I would be perfectly uh, usual, perfectly typical, to have something that's up to 15% off from that. And if we look at the graph that I've sketched out, you will notice that, although we are clustered around 0.65 there, uh, it is perfectly normal to be off by about 15%. That would be saying that I'd be clustered there and be anywhere between 80 and 50, and you can see that a large amount of your distribution does occur in that range, and it would be very common to get uh, data that's somewhere in that part of your distribution. Now, on the next problem, number 24, it wants to know uh, for what sample size um, that it would be okay to think this sampling distribution is approximately normal. Well, the rule to check for normality here is I need to check for n times p to be greater than 10 and n times 1 minus p. Now this is not an either or rule. If both of these conditions must be met. The reason there are two different conditions is you're basically checking both to make sure that you don't have too many successes likely to occur are too many failures. It's making sure that each tail does not extend too far. You're checking for skew in both directions of your distribution. So in this case, my sample size was 10. My probability of success is 0.65. So that was only 6.5. So I'm really not uh, large enough by that condition. On the other end, I have 10 times 
um, 0.35, which is going to give me an answer of 3.5. Now, what this is telling me is that neither my high tail or my low tail is uh, large enough to be normal. If you notice, uh, looking back at your graph on the uh, high end tail, uh, it looks better than the low tail, but you can still see some jaggedness to the graph. In other words, your sample size is not large enough to be able to approximate that histogram with a normal curve just because it's too jagged. On the other end, it's even worse if you look on this way because you definitely still do have some signs of skew in that direction uh, with that tail extending out further than it should for the normal distribution and even in the typical range you can see it's not balanced neatly around your um, mean population proportion 0.65 but it's lopsided even within that um, one standard deviation of the mean range so that definitely shows that it is not safe to call this normally distributed we'll go ahead and uh, work through part b to make sure everybody has this uh, for part b what i would be looking at is uh, the population proportion it's still going to be the same but i'm looking for the um, properties of the sampling distribution of the sample proportion for a sample size of 20. So the mean value is still going to be the same thing it was, 0.65. I'm not going to take the time to sketch out this one for 20, uh, but what is going to happen is it's going to start pulling everything in toward that 0.65 even more than we did with the 10. Uh, this one, I would be the probability of success times the probability of failure divided by the sample size, in this case 20, all under the square root. Uh, that comes out to be about uh, 0 0.10. Uh, six, six. So now instead of varying by 15% um, from your um, proportion, you're only varying by 10% typically. So we can see going from 10 to 20 made it much more accurate. We're still not sure on the shape, so I'm going to need to check n times p and n times 1 minus p to see if they are both greater than or equal um, greater than 10. Uh, this one I would be 20 times 0.65. So that would show that it was sufficiently large on this side uh, because 13 is greater than 10. So I'm good on the positive side of the distribution. Uh, on the negative or left side of the distribution, I would be doing uh, 20 times 0.35. In that case, it's only 7, which is getting close, but it's not greater than 10. So. I would say that this sample size was not large enough because it only met one of my two conditions to, uh, to ensure that the sampling distribution of the sample proportion is normally distributed. It's uh, going to be closer than it was at 10, but since only one of my two conditions was met, I'm going to have some problems on the left side or the negative side of this distribution uh, with it not being smooth enough to be approximately normal, and I cannot say the sampling distribution of p hat is normally distributed.